Our third reader tonight is a freelance writer and editor, seizing every opportunity to walk barefoot with half-painted toenails through airport security and stammer in pigeon tongues. Her travel writing has been anthologized in Whereabouts, Stepping Out of Place, and she is contributing editor and columnist for the online literary magazine Storiacious. You can find her go-go dancing at the occasional craft fair, obviously, and trying to hula hoop at the odd surfer space party. She can hold her breath for only 10 seconds, but can float for hours. Let's give a warm welcome to Melissa Wiley. Everybody. Um, this is true, but it's called Make Believe. So. Lovers' weekends are for pretending, but I had nothing to pretend as I had no lover, only a former Finnish exchange student named Minna meeting hers in New York for the weekend, and then myself, of course, to meet her. Myself, because the flight from Chicago to New York was so much shorter than to Helsinki, and who knew when she would be in North America again? Myself, whom she said I need only make believe, was with her real husband in order to relax and enjoy my time. Myself, who liked her husband, Freddie, well enough, but understood there were some problems there. Myself, who slept alone in my clean bed in a B&B for three consecutive nights. Myself, who left the man sitting next to me on the plane, an elevator engineer named Dave, buy me a Bloody Mary at 11 a.m. <laughs> because when you have no lover of your own, a free drink is the next best thing. <laughs> and then some late morning Tito's loosens the tongue, enough to appease to your cab driver how liberating travel is without one's spouse when he falls sepulchrally silent and passing the cemetery flanking the highway, you know for certain he has lost his wife. <coughs> you weakly apologize, though he assures you it was all a long, long time ago. So long, he says, you might as well call it a separate lifetime now. <coughs> this you call and tell your husband once you arrive at your hotel. Everything else, however, you leave unsaid. Minna was due to arrive Saturday with UC after visiting another friend in San Diego. She would take the first flight she could get, she told me with a flight attendant to our fare, but I knew her well enough to know she would take her time. So Saturday morning I walked the streets of the West Village and bought myself a copy of Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, whose pages I scanned but did not read for half an hour in a coffee shop called The Bee's Knees where the banana muffin tasted of wax and men in saw caps saw it brush, brushing their eyebrows like teeth with their fingers. Where I sat crossing and recrossing my legs while cracking my book spine wide open, though I already had a copy of the mandarins in my suitcase, a book I had meant to read on the plane while talking the flight away to the elevator, elevator engineer instead. So I walked the cement arteries of the village until I stopped inside a boutique. I bought a navy blue dress that fell like, a cur fell like a curtain to my knees. A dress so plain and so dark, I looked like a silhouette inside of it, like a person without a face, so as long as I avoided my eyes in the mirror. At three o'clock, I walked back to my hotel in the Diamond District, because even silhouettes become tired in the middle of the day, because without any real love in the afternoon, there is still the comfort of a warm bed. I slept for an hour, then I checked my messages, seeing none from Minna, and I left to walk some more. After peering inside an aquarium in a nail salon window, watching striped fish dart from the oxygen pump bubbles, I stopped inside a sushi restaurant for an early dinner, knowing Minna did not eat fish, and so savoring more time alone with Simone. I opened the mandarins just past its middle, reading her thinly veiled fictionalization of her affair with Nelson Algren. She had just flown to Chicago from New York. She had found love on a ma bare mattress in the middle of a kitchen floor, with a Schlitz sign leering through the picture window. She would lose the love again in time, of course, because she was married, 
conveniently, sexlessly, but mostly happily, to a fictionalized Jean Paul Sartre. And lovers may have their weekends, but they never have the whole week. They are creatures with beginnings and endings just like the rest of us, even if they sleep like fish with their eyes always open. But sipping miso soup on a cool March evening in New York with no lover aside from a long dead existentialist is its own species of comfort. And then rain had started to fall as I tweezed the last salmon roll from my plate. Rain I had expected because this too would make the lovemaking sweeter for Minna and Yusi when they arrived. Because lover's time may be limited, but the weather usually cooperates, sending them early to bed. Leaving the restaurant, I paced a few blocks down a side street, teeming with tobacco and hot chops then spotted a tangerine sign advertising Malaysian massages. Stepping through a doorway of hanging beads, I faced three chairs squeezed between dueling humidifiers in a room with peeling spider print wallpaper. Seeing only one chair filled with a woman reading a magazine behind half-closed eyelids, I sat in the middle and said I would like half an hour's foot massage. Hanging above my masseur's head was a yelling chart of the foot's anatomy, each nerve connected to another higher in the body. But the print was too small for me to read without squinting. And then I thought I would close my eyes too for a time, enjoying the touch for what it was, a paid service. 25 minutes later, the masseur swaddled up my feet in a hot towel and held them aloft in the air letting the blood drain from my toes back to my thighs. When the tire began to beat, he smiled and piped, Friend, now we go for pat pat? And I nodded and smiled, saying, Yes, I want pat pat very, very much. He led me to a room lit like a barren purple planet and whispered, I go, then you. I pointed to the bed in the room center, over which lay a single white towel thin as a crate. When he closed the door, I tossed my clothes and towel both onto the floor, lay prone beneath the lavender light, hungry for more touch. An hour, I'd specified this time. A few seconds later, he padded back inside. He lifted the towel from the floor and placed it over me, saying, no, over you, friend. And I sighed, <laughs> spelling my breath in a loose heap onto the carpet. Later that evening, Minna called me, saying she and Yusi had just arrived but that they, need, they needed an early night. Then I should come to their hotel, the Trump Soho, next morning at 11, and we would spend the day together. She added they had a lot of shopping to do. At 11 a.m. inside their suite, Minna was still in her bathrobe, you see in barefoot in jeans and a v-neck sweater. He was balding, smiling with all his teeth, as if, as if I had just said something very funny. So I said, said nothing more than, hello, I'm Melissa. An empty bottle of champagne lay on its side atop the console. All her suitcase clothes had spilled onto the, foot, the floor at the foot of the bed. She had hardly slept, she groused, because the elevator had kept her awake. She was too tired, even at sex this morning, she hopped with a flop back on the bed. But she did have such nice new clothes from San Diego and flew to the floor on her knees to show me. She rummaged through the pile, holding up a series of leopard print blouses with sequins for eyes at her nipples, each a brighter hue than the next, saying she had bought them all in a single shop fronting the beach, but they did such wonders for her figure, too. While she dressed in the bathroom, you seeing I sat at opposite corners of the bed. I asked him about his job, his apartment in Helsinki, his hockey league, his cottage in Lapland, though not his wife or their two children. His answer to everything was, fine, fine, very, very good, with only a tremor of his Adam's apple for variation. His life, I realized at once, was not an empty one. Compared to my own, it was as satisfying as, ch as a chicken dinner. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and I could see none of Nelson Algren in him. No shade of desperate hunger. None of the haunted look that real lovers, I always think, ought to have. While Minna hummed to herself, spraying her hair higher from her skull, I asked what he wanted to do. 
And he said, my suitcase has much space still, so I think I will fill it. So shopping for you too then, I asked. And he nodded, laughing, saying, yes, I like that very, very much. Walking outside, I'm going to ask what direction we should take. And I told her I was happy to wander any which way and people watch. But she said that Uniglo's flagship store should not be far. Uniglo's are springing up all over Europe, she asserted. And she had four of the same coat and four different colors. And I should get one, too. I admitted I was chilly with my thin jacket, but said I would warm up as I walked. When you see wearing a Uniglo light blue coat himself, sure that he too would like one in another color, now that we were here in New York. Inside the store, Minna strummed a rack of cotton dresses with freshly manicured fingers, saying, so nice, so cheap. You should get one, Melissa. Red, though, because you look better in color. But I walked on toward the sales section, thinking I might at least buy my husband something. So I plucked a navy blue hoodie from a hanger. But don't you want to buy yourself something, when I asked? I told her I'd already bought the dress I was wearing, that I had started to like navy blue more and more, that I thought it a prettier shade of black. After lunch, she and UC said they wanted to see my hotel, when I told them it wasn't much to see, but they insisted. We could walk if you like, I suggested, when they nodded in unison, zipping up their new Uniqlo jackets, one electric yellow, one electric pink, walking behind me with their arms braided around each other's waist. Inside the lobby, the concierge told me wine and cheese hour had just begun. I followed Minna and Yusi to the table at the back of the lobby, spearing myself a few cheese cubes, then sucking on the toothpick. After Minna drank two glasses of Chardonnay, I assumed we would browse more shops or visit a museum. But she wasn't in the mood for a museum, she said. And she and Yusi would do their real shopping tomorrow, once I had gone home. But she did want to see my room. She had worked as a cleaning lady one summer in college in the Munich Hotel, she said. She had taken an avid interest in them ever since. When I opened the door to my room on the 14th floor, she slipped her phone from her purse, saying, I'll photograph everything but the bed. Freddie would know we're not sharing that. Then she instructed me to stand next to the window and smile, pointing toward the Freedom Tower, just visible in the distance. You see, she told to stand in the bathroom so his reflection wouldn't filter into the skyline. It was only four o'clock, but I told her I needed a nap, that I too had tossed and turned all night, when in truth I had slept nine solid hours, that I would meet them back at their hotel at seven for dinner, we could go to a comedy club afterward, where I would sit with my knees nudging the stage, explicating any innuendo I knew lost more than a little something in translation. Before she left, Minna kissed me on each cheek and told me to rest, but I was looking tired about the eyes. When she shut the door, I took off my dress and draped it languorously as any lover's kimono over the chair. I pulled Simone and Nelson off the desk, I laid the book over my heart, watching the real lovers rise and fall, rise and fall. Oi.